Welcome everyone. My name is Aziza Hassan. I'm the executive director of Newground, a Muslim Jewish partnership for change. In Newground, we sit in the tension in the middle where we try to figure out how to work through hard things and be able to talk about the heat points of tension together. And today we are really grateful for your willingness to step in to this moment with us um, as we bear witness and continue to see and hold the unfolding catastrophe and famine from the war in Gaza and the compounding grief from October 7. Today, we'll be in conversation with academics and activists Omar Dejani and Mira Sukarov. Omar Dejani served as the legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiation team in peace talks with Israel from 1999 to 2001. He's currently a professor at law at McGeorge School of Law in at the University of the Pacific. And Mira Sukarov is professor of political science at uh, Carleton University. She's the author or co-author of five books, most recently Borders and Belonging, a memoir. When Andrea, Newground's associate director, first told me about Omar and Mira's partnership and her specific interaction with them, it was completely clear to me that we needed to continue and to or to have a discussion with them. And this is hopefully the first part of uh, many relations, many conversations, or, um, or at least that's our hope, because we see many mirrors between what we've been trying to do at New Ground and um, and the kind of uh, future that we want to continue to build towards together. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone who showed up for this conversation. Um, and I want to thank Mira and Omar so much for being here with us. Um, we were hoping to have you once you are as our one of our book group book folks, uh, once your book was published. And then um, we felt like we needed to have this conversation sooner rather than later. And um, it was, I can't believe it, but it was less than a year ago that I read your piece, uh, the piece you wrote in Haaretz about visiting museums and heritage sites together. It feels like five years ago, perhaps. Um, and I was just moved. I said, this is like, this is, this felt so much like the work we do. It felt like what happens when we hear from one another what is um, what gives us pride? What gives us joy in our own backgrounds? What matters to us, and also how some of the things that our peoples have done to one another have hurt us collectively and and personally. Even um, we spend a lot of time in our space doing that, and um, and then I I understand I had a back and forth with Mira first. And um, I understand that when the piece in the New York Times came out about Aziza and me, Omar saw it and sent it with the same kind of recognition. So we're just really grateful to be able to have this conversation. Um, so at Newground, we believe that conflict is natural and inevitable and staying inside it is a choice. That's language we've used. We, and we still, I think, um, it is still a very important guiding principle for us. And we're in the middle of unimaginable, like conflict that's gone, I think, beyond um, beyond what any of us, what I, I will speak for myself, what I imagine. So we've all been asking ourselves, fellows, staff, people in our network, why be doing this work? of talking and trying to understand one another when our worlds are on fire. Why not just go straight to activism, whatever that activism is, and only do that? So we're wondering how you are answering that for yourselves right now. And um, maybe we'll start with you, Mira. I think that talking is a form of activism, particularly in a world that's getting more and more polarized and in a world where we're dehumanizing the other so much and so often and talking it also really by talking i really also mean listening and reflecting and learning and changing and i think in terms of what to do in this moment everyone has to do what they can do and one of the things omar and i can do is talk and think and reflect only one 
but one of them. I, I was going to say almost exactly the same thing as Mira. I think it is a form of action. And while there are other really important forms of action at this juncture, um, and while it's crucial that we find ways of being politically engaged, especially here in the United States, in light of just how much influence the conversation that happens here has on lives and and circumstances in Israel, Palestine, and elsewhere. I do think uh, that talking matters. You know, I, you as you alluded to, Aziza, um, I, I worked um, in an earlier round of the negotiations process, good grief, you know, more than 20 years ago. Um, and I think that we entered into that process. We, um, those of us on the Palestinian team, a bunch of young lawyers with um, an insufficient understanding of the extent to which negotiation at the end of the day is a persuasive process. Um, we, all of us litigators entered with a sense that uh, we were going to make a case. And uh, I think over time, we came to realize that what we had to do was persuade um, our Israeli interlocutors and also um, our American mediators, if that's the right word for what the US was doing at that juncture. And, um, and that was a difficult realization. Uh, but with 7 million Palestinians and 7 million Jews sharing the land, at the end of the day, persuasion is um, the, way, the way that we will find a way forward. Thank you for both for that. I would love to hear more about your backgrounds as we kind of drill into your personal connections to the land. Um, and Omar, starting with you, like there's a story that I was really taken by um, where you take your dad back to Jaffa. Um, can you describe that for us and specifically the your mom's role and especially in your role and like what it meant to be there for your dad in that moment? Sure. So maybe I'll back up for just a moment to note that um, my father's family comes from uh, Jaffa um, and has very old roots in the city. Uh, my great, 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 great grandfather um, had been part of a delegation to Napoleon to plead with him to spare uh, the city's uh, uh, young men after um, uh, some of the uh, Ottoman uh, regiment had sent Napoleon's envoy uh, back to a ship headless. And um, and so we've got this old and deep connection to the place. And my father's family in April of 1948, and so this was weeks before Israel's independence was declared, weeks before any of the Arab states invaded, they, along with most of Jaffa's population, were forced out of their homes through bombardment. And made their way north to uh, Lebanon and then eventually Syria. And then in my parents' case, eventually to the United States. Um, and my father had never been back. He left when he was 16 years old um, and uh, had never been back. His brother had been and had seen the place where their house once was and had told me about it. And, um, and so when I was living there and working there and my folks came for a visit, I thought, that the best thing I could do was to take them right from the airport to Jaffa to my father's old neighborhood. I thought it was where he would want to go. And so we drove there and I think nothing could have prepared my father for what he found, which was a place so completely transformed that it was unrecognizable. Um, the streets were um, uh, remained to some extent the same, but few of the old structures were standing. Um, what he remembered of old ja of, of his neighborhood in Jaffa Ajami was to a great extent lost. And um, here I was, his sort of young son, kind of pulling him along saying, well, you know, do you remember this dad? That looks like an old building over there. Does this seem familiar? Um, and my dad overwhelmed was, uh, walking silently. Um, and eventually we made our way to uh, where the house once stood. And um, I continued to ask him questions until my mom um, 
sort of gently but firmly uh, grabbed my hand and said, let him be. And I think that he needed to absorb uh, the ways in which not only his hometown had changed, um, but um, the ways in which Palestine, the Palestine he knew had ceased to be. But I'll add just a postscript, if I, if I may, which was that a few days later, uh, um, days during which my dad seemed uh, somehow beyond reach. I mean, he really went into kind of a hole for a few days, and this, which was completely unlike him. Um, but uh, a few days later, we were in Ramallah and where I was living at the time. And we went, I took him to a little market to get some stuff. And he ended up in a conversation with a with an old fellow who was working the cash register about Jaffa. And, and my dad seemed to get animated again. And when we came out, I said, you seem better. And he said, you know, all this time I thought Palestine was gone but it's been here all along. And that was also, I think, really um, important. Thank you, Omar. It's a very powerful story. Um, and, and Mira, um, I think one of the stories that we're interested in, in hearing about from you is the time that you spent in Israel. You have Israeli family, um, and you also have a kibbutz family that you're close to, that you came to connect to during your time um, on your junior year abroad. And, um, and you spent some time there right before October 7th. Um, and there's been impact since then, um, clearly. And we're just interested in how did you get to the kibbutz? What in your background drew you to spend that time in Israel and to um, and to really put roots down in a certain kind of way or find roots. I don't know. You can tell us how you describe it. Mm -hmm. Those are both intriguing options. I have to think about that formulation, whether we look for roots or we place roots. And one thing I was thinking of, so I've heard Omar tell the story before, the one you've just heard. I've heard him tell it many times, but each time I get something a little bit new from it, and today I got something new that really helps me understand what I'm going to tell you about myself. And that is, Omar, what you needed from your dad in that moment. And your mom could see that struggle and was the one to, to kind of put, um, tamp down your needs in favor of what he was needing. And when I think about that, for me, I had so many needs that I realized Israel was fulfilling for me. And in the case of the kibbutz, it was a place for me to feel connected. And, and I, I had been studying Middle East studies in college and I was in my junior year and I went on weekend visits to a kibbutz near the, um, in the Northern Negev region near Gaza. In the end, I spent even more time on a, another kibbutz that was even closer to the Gaza fence, but it was all with the same family and similar community members. And I had read so much labor Zionist literature in my own st academic studies that I um, really knew a lot about various thinkers and a lot of what we know about labor Zionism. It's, we don't use that term as much anymore, but socialist Zionism, liberal Zionism, leftist Zionism, is that there was a really intense romantic connection with the land, but not necessarily a theological sense and not necessarily a sense of ownership, but more a sense of stewardship and that you would tend to the land and that in turn would remake you in a corporal sense and um, remake the Jewish people as a people that have uh, control over their own fate. And if there's one thing I can think about in my own background is when I was a child, I had very, well, we all have very little control over our own fate, but sometimes it's less apparent. And in my case, I think because of particular aspects of my background, my parents' divorce, being primary and Jewish community in the mid 70s in Winnipeg, it was a very rare thing to grow up with divorced parents and some other struggles that my family underwent. That when I got to Israel, it really felt like home and it felt like a community that I could um, make as my own and earn as my own through knowing Hebrew and talking Hebrew and being putting myself um, sharing myself with these pe with people on the kibbutz and it felt very very meaningful 
And so when October 7th happened, I was immediately concerned about my kibbutz family who I knew lived less than two kilometers from the Gaza Strip. They eventually moved to a different kibbutz where I visited them. And I even took Omar to visit them last July and he slept in their secure room. They gave the Palestinian the secure room. They gave the Jew the room down the stair, uh, down the hall, and then they slept in their master bedroom. And that night in July, there were sirens from Hamas rockets. Fortunately, they didn't um, land anywhere near the house. They landed a few hundred meters from the house, but fortunately we were all safe and secure. But on the morning of October 7th, there were sirens and my kibbutz family went into that secure room as usual. But this time they heard Hamas militants outside their door and they narrowly escaped being murdered or taken hostage. Thank you, Mira. Um, Omar, would you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you to be on the kibbutz there and then sure. afterward? Yeah. It was strange. Uh, so on the one hand, um, Mira's kibbutz family was incredibly hospitable. Um, they're uh, in a very Israeli way, uh, which is which is different than my experience of uh, of Arab hospitality, um, although uh, Mira's kibbutz dad is an Arab Jew or a Mizrahi Jew with Iraqi roots, um, and what I mean by that is that um, uh, they showed their hospitality uh, by setting out an extraordinary meal for us, by dropping everything and taking us all around, uh, by engaging with us and introducing us to so many of their friends in different communities all around the area uh, so that I was able to come away with a real sense of who these people are um, and of their attachment to one another and to place. And that was important because I had spent a lot of time in the Gaza Strip when I was uh, living and working in Israel, Palestine, um, but had really never visited any of those uh, communities before. And so um, it was, it was, powerful for me to feel that sense of connection, but I couldn't help but also feel a sense of isolation. Um, it was strange to me uh, to be the only or one of the only Palestinians around, um, especially in light of the fact that, you know, we could see Gaza City in the distance, I mean, a few kilometers away. Um, and I think that the, the moment that was sort of, one of the moments that was most difficult for me was, you know, we were, we were driving in between places and, you know, in that part of the country, the, the land is spectacularly beautiful and it was very green at that juncture, uh, even though it was midsummer. And, um, and in a conversation I was having with, uh, with, with one of the, with one of Mira's kibbutz parents, um, I remarked on its greenness and how different it was from the Gaza Strip. And um, and they said, oh, you know, it's a shame they don't have more water there. And it was a natural, it was an understandable thing for them to say, but of course there was here, right? It's what prevents Palestinians in the Gaza Strip from having more water is the political regime that um, separates Israelis and, and Palestinians. It's the arrangements in place because it's one country, um, may ultimately be two states if we have what we hope for, but it's one country. And to imagine that there is a there and here was a very strange thing, even though it was an obvious part of the reality. Yeah, yeah. A, a there and here, and also um, somehow a disconnect about seeing that and understanding it, it sounds I, like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this brings me to our next question, which is how did it come for the two of you to be in that kibbutz together in the first place? What is the project that you're working on together? How did it come to be? And um, and also, how has it been impacted by the event since October 7th? Is that oh, so, Mira, um, let's you? let's uh, let's start with Mira, I guess this time. Um, yeah, so we um, I approached Omar when uh, I kept getting rejections for my latest book proposal, 
and I realized it was time to bring in a Palestinian voice. And um, I hadn't been ready yet. I had wanted to s still have a soul byline. I wanted to still go it alone. I wanted it to be Sukarov's, that's my last name, um, unique vision. But I, I was ready for the kind of um, compromise of ideas and instincts that a a joint Jewish collaboration might yield. So it was May 2021, and as many of you will remember, that was the last act of hostilities between Israel and Hamas. And Omar had posted on Facebook a short, a very short uh, blog post about his own personal attachment to the Gaza Strip and his father's story of being driven out of Jaffa at age 16. And I shared it. I was moved because it was both informative, educational, um, factual, and personal. And I pressed uh, forward. I pressed share. And then Omar did something that's very uncool in social media um, uh, land. He thanked me publicly for sharing it. Usually you're not supposed to thank anyone. You're just supposed to be pleased as punch that you get attention. And then um, we started talking a bit more. And I asked him if he was interested in some in working together on some projects. And we realized soon enough that what we really both had was, I would say, well, I'm not going to say that I have a gift. So I'll say what Omar had was a gift for really um, conviction and empathy and awareness and interest in the emotional aspects of all of this. And whereas in my field, um, tr traditionally in international relations, there was always a push to separate rationality from emotions as if they're at odds. Over time in my field, we've come to realize that the two are really necessary in order to make wise decisions, in order to understand the ways of the world. Emotions aren't less than, they can be very um, uh, enriching and informative um, insight and, and providing a lot of insight. So we thought, why don't we go to Israel-Palestine together over the next year or two multiple times together and why don't we show each other what is most important and valuable and precious to us in terms of people and places and see what happens what do we end up seeing and experience that we wouldn't have seen or experienced even if we're looking at the same thing even if we've both been to jerusalem many times even if we've both been to tel aviv many times what happens when the other so-called is next to us and so that's what we proceeded to do over um, that's what we have proceeded to do over the last two years. And it's been very meaningful and also challenging and hard and painful. Thank you so much. Aziz, I think the next question is yours. Oh, I thought Omar, Omar I would actually love to Oh, we didn't get, oh, I'm so sorry. About, we didn't get to hear from, yes, please, and, Omar. What's the project? As you leave, Forgive me, Andrea. As you leave, yeah. as Omar, I'm actually really curious to hear about that story of your dad at 16 that Mira just brought up. Uh, specifically, also because um, my family, when we became refugees, my dad's family, especially in 1948, there was a point in the junction where they were they going to go into the route that they eventually took, or were they going to be one of the refugee families that went to Gaza? And I look at what's happening in Gaza right now. And I still like my breath just I can't I can hardly breathe when I think about that it literally could be our family um, going through this and people could be justifying the things that are happening there to my to my loved ones. Um, and I'm wondering how you're sitting with all of that as you work on this project. So similarly to your experience, I mean, I, I um, was just in a conversation uh, the other day with a, a fellow Palestinian legal academic and um, also with family from Jaffa, whose, whose family made the choice to go south instead of going north, as my family did, and um, and who is on pins and needles every single day waiting to hear that her family members have lived another day. And they've already lost a number of people, um, a number have been killed, and a number... Um, a, a worrying number are have disappeared and people don't know whether they are dead or whether they've been taken into custody. Um, and so she lives with this daily apprehension um, and, and anguish. And I uh, feel that of course, as a fellow human being, as a fellow Palestinian, um, but also as someone whose family could have gone that way. But I, I think that I, I, 
the fact that my my father and his family went north and um and went ultimately to Syria where uh, he met my mom and and um and that we've had this very mixed background um upbringing this upbringing rooted in a, a range of different backgrounds religious muslim christian alawi um uh national uh palestinian syrian french um and as a consequence of the way things have unfolded also that we've sort of moved from we moved from the middle east to um europe to the united states has given me a set of perspectives that i'm and privileges of course that i'm incredibly grateful for um but is is in a funny way a kind of gift i mean mira and i um struggle a lot with what it means to be members of our respective diasporas and what diasporas have to contribute. And, and there are ways in which diasporas contribute grief to uh, the peoples of that country and others, right? But I think, you know, the kind of connection that, that she and I have and that I feel with, you know, the many other uh, Jewish friends who are very close to me um, in my life who are important, is that this winding path made possible an array of relationships that also makes possible a way of seeing what's happening in Israel-Palestine and a way of seeing the future that is harder um, if uh, you haven't had the privileges and opportunities that we have. And so it's this complicated uh, mixture of, of emotions. Yeah, relating to that mixture of like conflicting different emotions all happening at once and all of them really being real. Um, and kind of picking up on that thread of diaspora communities, um, I've really been struck by like, like I've got friends who are rabbis who will have, have said many things over the years and received a lot of big responses from their congregants saying, you're not Israeli, you have no idea what's going on, like stay out of it or whatever it is. But point is, is that you don't know is the answer. And then um, and then also um, as Palestinians, like the pieces of fracture in all of different places, but like people in Jerusalem in a very different place than people in Ramallah. Um, they have different rights. They have their ability to move is very different. Um, and so people in the occupied Palestine are, uh, you know, in different roads, et cetera. And then people in Gaza are also in different places, in a completely different place. And then there's also diaspora communities, some of whom are in uh, refugee camps or in Jordan um, or wherever. And then people who are in diaspora in the United States, which is kind of where our base is. And so you've got all these constituencies and people in different places and they actually have rights in very different ways and privileges in different ways. And so given all of those things and kind of like knowing that with great humility, we actually come at this with great privilege. Um, what is the role of like American, so let's say North American, Raja Khouri, who's one of the authors of The Wall Between is on the call with us, like North American diaspora communities from our you know respective places, like what what is a, a solid role that some of us could play more effectively? Um, and uh, maybe Umar, we start with you and we go to Mira. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think that part of our role, so I, I think it's certainly the case that to the extent that we're able to share the privilege that we have, um, that that's crucial. And so I think there are all sorts of ways I'm trying to support folks um, uh, back home, as we say, um, uh, financially and um, morally in this moment. And I think that that's really important, e enabling people to feel the knowledge that there's someone watching, that there's someone who cares, that there's someone who's not going to let the story die. Um, and um, those sort of like that solidarity is really important. But, but I also think um, hand in hand with that, um, the work of imagining is really, really important. And, you know, I think it it is, you know, Mary and I were just having this kind of conversation the other day about um, self-determination and, and Jewish statehood and sort of thinking about um, 
uh, what what versions of Palestinian and, and Jewish self-determination each of us embraces and is comfortable with. And, and, um, and over the course of the conversation, one of the things that I was trying to communicate was that um, even though I am, I've, I've come to the point where like I uh, think that it is important within that land, Israel-Palestine, for both peoples to have self-determination. Like I'm a, I've become deeply committed to mutual self-determination. I'm also deeply ambivalent about national identity. And, um, and so the idea that Mira and I would be on opposite ends of a, a national or ethnic divide, rather than being alike in some ways and different in other ways of um, both being secular, both being urban, um, even while also having different traditions. And I think that understanding the ways in which each of us has a plural identity, um, the ways in which um, there is possible possibility, the possibility for real dynamic movement for shifts over time is a product of having grown up in the places where we've grown up um, and seeing that we can relate to each other in these ways and because that's what we've done. And I think that that is a gift that um, those of us um, living in this part of the country, and especially folks involved in the work of the kind that you're doing uh, right now, um, it's a gift that we can give to our, our friends and relatives and others over there to sort of say, hey, there's a whole world that's possible if we shed a certain way of thinking. It's, it's more challenging for me. So this is when I always try to get points from Omar saying, can you feel sorry for me, please? Because I'm the one representing the relative level of power and privilege. And that's the way I... Um, try to work him to where I need him to be because Omar talks about solidarity and with his people and my people, my Israeli friends and family are not, I know because I've talked to them are not feeling the kind of solidarity from me that they wish they were seeing. And I'm trying to give it to an extent while also trying to stop the massacre going on in Gaza and also trying to demand a return of hostages, which is why I'm very happy. And I was teaching my Israel-Palestine course today when the um, UN resolution, when the UN Security Council resolution uh, passed and was signed and students who were quicker on their phones than I was while I was trying to teach alerted me. And it has both those demands in it, a ceasefire and return of hostages. And uh, there are many, people in my community who would rather that I take a side um, that they perceive to be full throttle support of them and I perceive to thereby uh, deny the Palestinians uh, dignity and safety and so I'm always trying to thread the needle between um, making my people feel heard and standing up for what I think is right and it, it's it's exhausting. And I'm also, I'm quite different right now, my mode right now in this conversation, because this is, I sort of feel, oh, am I going to use the term safe space? Sorry about that. But I do feel kind of emotionally safe because of the, the combination of people on this call that we're, we're Palestinians and Jews. And I feel like you all get it, at, at least the four people here. I don't know all the people in the, in the guest room, but I'd love to get to know all you more. And when I'm on social media, for example, I feel I'm in a slightly different mode because I'm getting criticized from a particular direction and I feel I need to um, make uh, educate people and bring um, facts to bear that they may not be aware of and it becomes a lot more brittle and a lot more binary and I'm not always that comfortable with that so different modes for different uh, venues and uh, it's a constant it's a constant challenge certainly a challenge and like you said it's exhausting because you're you're trying to be effective with your words you're trying to describe really hard things that need to be described and you don't want to avoid the hard things because you know you have to be true to what you're trying to do in the world. Um, and so uh, before we start shifting and asking questions from the audience, I'd like to remind anyone who's here who um, you can 
uh, write a question in the chat box and it'll come to us as moderators. Um, and then we'll make sure to ask uh, Mira and Omar. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Mira and Omar, do you have any questions for us that you'd like to explore? I think you're muted, Mira. Mira. Oh, I'll ask to unmute you. Sorry, I pressed something accidentally. Omar and I have had some fights over the months and we've discussed some of them in, in, um, in other talks and we may not have time to rehash them here, but you folks here can look them up on other talks that we've done. But one way that I um, cope with um, struggle, the, in, the interpersonal and political struggle that emerges between us is hearing about how other pairings and creative and political partnerships are doing it. So um, do you, uh, Aziza and Andrea, have any uh, stories to share and how you came out the other end and how you healed? Um, I think it's a constant, well, first of all, I would say also Ben and Tasneem are on this call, Ben Ginsburg and Tasneem. And I would say that our staff, this is the full-time staff and we have other folks, um, we have gone to places we never had to go before with one another. Um, and so it's been like a really deep, and also with a board, like we've gone to deep places and had to confront things and blind spots. I very much um, in the conversation that you had around Anu, the Museum of the of the Jewish Peoplehood, I think. Um, I very much related to Mira, your blind spot of like, here's all the joy and Omar like needing to come in. I mean, I'm sure you are aware of it. Um, um, and, you know, having, hearing from Omar what it feels like that in this his, in this really important museum that describes very important things about Jewish experience, being in that land it did not acknowledge the other people in that land, right? And so I don't know if that was actually a blind spot for you. I, I, I tend to think you were overdoing it a little bit in there, but I'm not sure. Um but that can I can I say yeah something? please I'm more aware of it when I'm with a fellow Jew you probably have this experience too and I would I would say I would be the one to say hey where are the Palestinians in the story and I'm when I'm with Omar I want Omar to say isn't our experience touching and moving so I am two different people depending on who I'm with and that's part of how I negotiate all these difficulties oh I'm ding, ding yeah yeah, yeah. um there are things that I see and feel in a different way. Um, I will say that the Muslim experience post 9-11, I've been in this work for almost a decade and every single year, um, I, I see things I hadn't seen before. I find out that I, I still have another blind spot there. And unfortunately, I feel like this moment has really brought it out. Um, the there's so much fear in the Jewish community about anti-Semitism here on college campuses and many other places. And there is rising anti-Semitism, both on the right and 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 within, um, unfortunately, within some of the stuff going on as a result of what's happening right now in Israel, Palestine. And I think I see that the Jewish community um doesn't necessarily see how silence at, because we're experiencing being silenced. Some of us are being are experienced being silenced in a new way um, for the first time that this is the way that Muslims and Palestinians have felt for a very long time. Um, and, you know, I had heard stories post 9-11 of people losing jobs or people being Muslims losing jobs or being detained um, for saying the wrong thing. And now we're starting to see that again. And I will say post, where are we time-wise? Post 20, like in that 2021 period, I had this feeling of watching many Palestinian Americans I knew who didn't, it was, didn't really, it felt uncomfortable. It was awkward often in situations to just stay who they were. And that started to shift because we were starting to see differentiated Palestinian stories. And so Palestinians in the American context were actually becoming 
a, a three-dimensional community for us in America. And that was so wonderful to see. And there is a, um, a zero sum nature. There seems to be like society is wanting all of us to be in boxes. Um, and, and so we're getting this zero sum identity piece. So as like on the street, Palestinian story, not, not necessarily in the political realm so much, but in certain ways, Palestinians are being seen in, in a way that is now impacting the way Jews are being seen. And I wish, I wish it didn't have to be that way. I wish we could just all hold what's, you know, what's hard for us and what's beautiful for us side by side, um, which I know in a polarized environment is sometimes too much to ask. Right. I mean, to be trauma informed is to know that people are going to have big reactions. And right now we're in this space where all of us are activated at different times. We don't always know when like the right, the whatever the trigger is going to happen. And then like, I know, and like receive somebody's big response, but like, I guess the part is hard for me is like when I get activated and like we did some work with the trauma resource Institute and they just helped us think about, okay, well, here's what you can do to just help reduce your own temperature when you're in the midst of a hard conversation. Um, and that was really helpful. We've been doing this for a really long time, or at least for me, it feels like a really long time. And, the, and yet it feels like this was so different because you, I felt a need to be able to advocate and to tell stories that I also felt silenced on at the same time. And like, what does it mean to still be able to Hold someone's humanity and and share the story um or and especially like i would get activated when it so, uh, something would rub up against something that would happen in my family and so like it's interesting that like what you talked about with museums my brother and i tried to follow my grandmother's footsteps from 1948 my dad was like four years old when they were forced off of their land and had to go through their journey of loss and and there's all sorts of levels of grief in within that that have informed also how we were raised but i remember going to this this um uh there's a prison um in, nor in, in the north that um my grandfather was held in the 1930s because he was one of the revolutionaries and there's a there's a museum there and like we walked through the museum and it's basically a monument to and a tribute to some of the folks who now it is like the way it's put up as a tribute to the people who helped establish the state. Um, and it's like there and, the, and there's this one door that says this is where Baha'u'llah was uh, held. And so that's up on the main floor. But it's not until you go all the way down to the bottom. There's this little tiny paragraph down below where it's like, oh, and the majority of the people who were held in this prison were Palestinian. And it was like, we're like not just an afterthought. Like the next museum we went to, we were literally made like to look like idiotic caricatures. And it's like, that's the representation. And like, I just remember like walking through and Omar, my brother, and I were walking through and one of the guards who had told us where to go, he's like, what, what happened to you guys? Did you not find where you wanted to go? And we're like, yeah, we found it. Um, but like the way the history is depicted was like, it just kind of like we were just kind of in the dumps. And he's like, oh, and then he laughs at us. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that like, what did he call it? He said, Tariq Zawad or something like that. So it was like, like um, a history that is made up. And the truth is, is the part of it is made up because like our history is like completely wiped away. And so it's like, whenever I hear somebody else's story or I want to articulate it and it feels like there's not space for it, parts of my triggers kind of start to come up. And it's because of those other parts, right? Of my own experiences. And so the parts that have helped me have been like literally, um, uh, Andrea and other members of the team just listening to the stories and helping me refine them um, because sometimes like they it feels like they land on deaf ears and I just need help telling the story because um, it matters so much and then the other parts are like literally staying on a google doc for hours 
just refining two to three paragraphs. And it's like, we're going to get through this. We're going to do our best. And at some points, like I'm triggered other times, Andrea is, and other times as a board member, and it just, everybody takes their turns. And like we're, we're each trying to listen. What is it that needs to be said here? And what can we say together? Um, and it's like you said earlier, it's exhausting. And it's really important to work through. I, I couldn't agree more. If I could just add one thing. I, I mean, so much of what you said resonated, not least because my grandfather was also in the same um, prison um, that you described. Um, and there's, anyway, I'll save the stories for another time, hopefully when we meet in person. But um, they're walking through these spaces can be so triggering when you feel excluded. And each of us has had that experience. But I, I, but the the converse I find is also true that um, that for me, you know, Amir and I spent some time on the plot of land where my father's family's house once stood, and and we were tape recording it for a podcast that we've been talking about developing, and and um, and I, you know, was going on and on about stuff um, on the recording. I, I as I've listened to it since. And um, and Mira was just incredibly supportive. She was present and she was listening, and uh, you know, bearing witness. Um, and and that was helpful to me. That um, in a context where I was feeling that so much of our uh, historical presence has been erased, uh, to have a, a Jewish person there with me hearing and acknowledging was really powerful even if the official narratives haven't changed uh, the ways in which I'd like them to. Um, I'd li like to oh, like to talk a little bit about Jerusalem. Um, so one place that's kind of come up is listening to Aziza talk about how hard it was in as she was beginning to go into all of these Jewish spaces and, and hearing like next year in Jerusalem and having her own like deep connection and feeling, um, feeling like it, it, that, just feeling how that smarted for her. And I think maybe one of those times might even have been when you came to hear me lead prayers and at the end of Yom Kippur, and that's what we're dancing and singing. And then to hear you, Aziza, to um, like come to like soften and open toward that, um, that was actually really healing to me because um, I'm Jewish. I'm like deeply Jewish. And Jerusalem is such an essential part of who we are. And one of the hard things, I think, for me in um in some of the language I hear from people who I just don't think understand that connection. Um, I, you know, I want to say sometimes to my Muslim friends, like you turn three times a day toward Mecca and we've been turning toward Jerusalem since, since our, our, since our people left. I don't know exactly how I think about that. I think it's a very complex set of histories but certainly our, um, our religious life is geared toward the harvest festivals of that place of, you know, and, and so I, I don't, I don't think that that gives us some kind of um, exclusionary political right, but I, I do feel that I want my connection to be seen and understood even as I walk through Jerusalem and I see, like, I see pal older, old Palestinian homes on the streets named after um, events in the 48 war. Oh, certainly. It's, it's interesting. Like what you brought up is like, I've been into, cause I usually get the golden ticket for the, for the high holidays. I'm like in multiple synagogues all over the city. Um, and you're right. Like the first, I don't know, six years, maybe every time when people would say next year in Jerusalem, something deep would cut and I would feel the sting. Um, and it doesn't feel that way as much anymore. It's more like I see my friends and like 
the last time Andrea came back from Jerusalem, she actually brought me a beautiful image of a historic picture of the Dome of the Rock that was taken in the 19, early 19 part of the centuries. And so um, I, there's a softening that happens over time. And I think that's part of why Omar, and then your story with your mom and your dad, and when you went back, is like, sometimes I try to rush things and it actually just leads to more pain. Um, and giving things the space to just hold, even if they are hard, and just actually being there with each other, there's something actually that's really important right there. Um, yeah, and I'll say that I know that we're getting close to the hour and we got some questions that are coming in. Um, and uh, for we've got one that's that's come in. Um, so for both of you. Do you have like personal stories of reciprocity, like where you experienced, you can, you kind of spoke into this of like being perceived differently. And even if it's not per perfectly reciprocal, like somebody is uh, receiving your story, um, but where you did actually feel like you were seen or acknowledged. Um, yeah. And if you could walk us through that. Well, for me, for sure, when I went to, um, when I took Omar to the key, my kibbutz family's kibbutz, and that night I um, wrote to him because he was, I knew he was trying to finish his grading for law school. Being a law professor, the grading apparently just doesn't end. And I, and I interrupted him, I know you're busy grading, but I want to tell you how meaningful this is to me to have you here in this, in this space in this community with these people who I love so much in this house that I've where I have so many memories and it's just really amazing for me and Omar replied it's very extraordinary for me too and that I just that was so um I really felt seen and I knew that it wasn't simple for him I knew that extraordinary doesn't isn't doesn't mean um, that we're just in an ice cream parlor having banana splits. I knew that it was layered for him and that I felt the generosity that he could use, that he could respond in that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that's been, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I mean, I think um, even though it has been hard, as Mira had gestured to earlier, um, sort of, um, T taking each other to all of these places uh, that were important and um, seeing the ways, so I'll sp speaking for me, seeing the ways in which Mira has been willing to struggle through stuff um, has been um, humbling and, and, um, and I think is maybe more than anything else, what keeps me committed to the works, the work that we're doing, because like, I mean, it's not, it, and it's it's in a funny way, it's both things. I think that part of what drew me to working with Mira in particular was the fact that she wasn't like um, uh, a longstanding anti-Zionist Jew because I wanted to work with someone on these questions who had an attachment and was struggling to figure out how to make sense of that in light of everything else that's happening and in, in light of what um, uh, Israel uh, has done and has stood for at moments in its history. But um, but that that you know we'll challenge each other and then keep trying um, to find a different way of seeing or to reconcile it in some ways is valuable. And I think that when things break down is when we uh, somehow get caught up um, stopping trying, you know. And like I know for myself, sometimes I'll just feel like I'll feel the burden of my community at moments like feeling like I've got to represent and and that I've got to say to I've got to say to Mira what she needs to hear meaning what Jewish people worldwide need to hear in this moment right and and those are the points when you know things become most brittle but but I think more often um it's that trying that I feel so grateful for can I ask a follow-up to that real quick is like both of you like what about when people don't reciprocate um, what keeps you in it? People as in each other or people out there? Uh, you know, people, I, yeah, I'm going to leave it to you, but like, a, but like specific to you and your work and your, 
like sometimes like there's moments that it's hard for me to stay in the work like what keeps you in it especially when people aren't reciprocating having an editorial deadline helps our editor is waiting for a book so that helps um, but that's a material reason i think you're really asking about something deeper and really important the social reason i think it's the um i think it's ultimately the uh gratifying feeling when you do feel heard and you know that if you work or you hope that if or i hope that if i work just a little bit harder to get past that the the break I, well where you said when things break down to get past the the breakdown to overcome the breakdown that there will be a sense of healing in this so when you said it didn't matter whether we meant omar and i or general so omar and i have had some tough times where we've had to examine how we spoke to each other and what we could have done differently and what was what was going on for each of us in that moment and i'm thinking even with my students where there might be a moment where i'm feeling tested by a student, but I keep them after class with others, not not as in a detention, as in I'm around to continue this conversation if you have a few minutes, the invitation to stay after class with a few others. And I really try to hear what they're trying to say. And then I say, okay, I, now I understand what was at stake here for you and what was that. And, and so here's a new way around it. And there's a feeling of, um, it can feel gratifying when, when you overcome that, that moment. Omar, any, just before we close, any, any of your thoughts on this? Um, it is, it is, uh, the, this attempt that we're all engaged with to, um, find ways of talking, I think going back to where we started the conversation is connected to um, a desire to try to find ways to um, bring bring peace in Israel Palestine, and and the thing is that I just don't see an alternative. I mean, like I I think as frustrated as I get sometimes, um, you know, we are going to live together over there forever. That's our fate. Um, and I'm not a fatalist, but I, you know, the, uh, absent some horrific further acts of ethnic cleansing, that is that is what our future holds. And so, aside from what we learn and the ways in which this illuminates things inside of us that are important and brings us maybe closer to God in some respects, um, and you know, my conception of God uh, lines up with that. Um, I um I think that we just don't we simply don't have an alternative. So we better get down to it. Thank you, Omar, and thank you, Mira. We are so grateful for the opportunity to begin a what I hope is the the beginning of a conversation with you um both. And that we will definitely have you back when the book is done. Um and in the meantime, just um I'd like to end almost where Omar ended, um, which is the, in, in Hebrew, the word Yerushalayim means the city of wholeness, actually. And um, I, I, my sense, Omar, is that you and I may have the same theological relationship to that idea. Um, um, and it may be very far away right now, but we're just grateful to be in the work with you and grateful to people who've shown up um, to struggle alongside, even while our worlds are burning. Um, so we're gonna close it out and we're gonna um, invite folks who have some time to stay about a half an hour to hang, hang on. We're gonna give about a minute for everyone who isn't gonna stay to, um, to jump off. And um, we'll we'll have some some more intimate conversations with participants. <laughs>